Well, hello, Gabrielle. How are you today? I'm well. How are you? Oh, just toasty and wonderful on this fine, uh, I think it's we're in February, February 21st, perhaps. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, I appreciate you joining, uh, joining me today for this conversation because, you know, we've known each other for a minute. Just, just a minute. Oh, <laughs> a few decades, which is crazy. Decades. <laughs> <laughs> um, but you know, the whole purpose. I mean, you've known me for a while. I'll say that a couple of decades almost um, is to create this wonderful space for women and their allies to appreciate and create this common space where you know if we're going through something we talk about it because if you can't talk about it with honest and on with honesty and frank conversation then it just gets worse right. so kind of put it out there so that people can hear about you learn from you and also you know resonate with like your life because your journey has been incredible and i am so happy that i've had a you know had a um seat in the stands during it it's been uh, watching you has been amazing. selling yourself short you've had an impact in this <laughs> right like <laughs> you were with me during those crucial years my college years right so i think you definitely have helped put me onto a good trajectory and definitely have helped keep me grounded so well, I appreciate that, but I think you're probably one of the hardest working kids that I've ever worked with and also a kid that knew how to finesse the system to do exactly what you needed to do to get the job done and then look good doing it. <laughs> so, you know, as we're talking today, you know, I just want to remind everybody that's listening that these are our, this, these are Gabrielle's and my, you know, opinions based on our expertise in the fact that these are just experiences. These are the things that we've went through. So we're not claiming to be medical professionals or anything like that. We're just real people having a wonderful, you know, a wonderful conversation on, you know, what makes, I'm going to call it Gabs, Gabby, <laughs> Gabs. It's, that's your name for life for me. I know. What makes, yes, yes. What makes you so, you know, wonderful and that's not being over the top it's like you're one of those kids and yes kid that has just stuck with me so i'm blessed that you're here and i can't wait to you know you know learn more let everybody else learn more about you so you know i'm introducing gabrielle joffy richards and gabby tell us about yourself sure so i've definitely had an unusual path um i don't know if i should go like so deep or like give my quick spiel about who i am what i do um so for the the shorter version i am a body positive advocate curvy fashion expert and i work as a branding marketing executive during the day and then on the side because everyone has a side hustle i run my blog called round away girl and I own my own essential oils company called Aromapy. So I do a lot. Um, and, you know, it's fun and it's fulfilling for me. But if I had to sum it all up into one, I love making people feel good and the skin that they're in. And she's missing one of the most, you know, one of the things that I just love about her so much is that she's an amazing human being, but she's also an athlete. She's an athlete for life. And, you know, I just remember times of working with you and just knowing that, you know, you know, who you are, you're, you're exactly when we're talking about no labels, no boundaries, not one word describes, I mean, you're building your empire. Wow, that's deep. Yes, I am trying to. So to piggyback off of that, yes, I am an athlete. I played lacrosse. And so in high school, I played uh, squash, lacrosse and volleyball. Um, I went to boarding school, you know, so I was in one of those environments where you had to do an activity. So you either had to be like in a, the theater department or in the arts, or you did a sport. And so for me, um, I'm from Jamaica, Queens, and I'm like, if I'm going to be in this, you know, different experience for the next four years, I want to do something that I wouldn't be able to do like back at home. And so, you know, my first, um, season right playing sports I played volleyball and I sucked I wasn't good 
But at Mercersburg is like, it doesn't matter if you're not good, you still could be a part of the team. And so one of the things I learned while playing volleyball is that I was a really good cheerleader. So I motivated everyone on the team, right? Even though I'm on JV on the bench, I'm like, we got it, go team, right? And so then the next, so that winter, I first tried out for the diving team. I don't think you know this, uh, Coach Val. Oh. Uh, and I like would swim, but like at the beach, right? And enough to stay above water. I didn't know diving was so involved. And so I remember trying out <laughs> and I jumped into the water. Mind you, I didn't have a, like one of those fancy suits that everyone has on. I think I had on like a, a fashionable swimsuit. So already the coach is looking at me like, okay, but again, he can't tell me I can't do it, right? It's one of the rules. So I jump, I like dive off of the board into the water. And I kid you not, it takes me like two minutes to get up out of the water. Cause I'm like, oh God, <laughs> getting back up. And at the end of that tryout, he pulls me to the side. He's like, hey, uh, good, good job out there. But you know, I, I think you'll be good at the squash team. Do you want to try out for that? And I was like, oh. I was like, what squash? He's like, well, it's like tennis, but you're in the box. I was like, okay, I'll try out for that, right? That was his like subtle way of saying, you suck at this and I can't tell you you suck. So please go and be on somebody else's team. So I tried out for squash and oddly enough, I was good at squash, okay? And I think it was from me like training, playing volleyball for some reason. Uh, Cause you know, even though you're not playing in the physical games, you're still, you know, training with the rest of the team. and so with squash, I developed really good hand-eye coordination. So let's pair that with me, you know, being a cheerleader. So good communication skills in volleyball, good hand-eye coordination uh, and squash. And so then what led me to lacrosse, I was, you know, in my dorm, I overheard the girls talking and saying, yeah, I can't wait to go to Florida for spring break. And I'm like, how are you guys going to Florida? What's going on? Cause I'm like, I don't want to go back to Queens for spring break. So tell me like, how you, how are you guys going? They're like, oh, for lacrosse. And I'm like, oh, what's that? They're like, oh, okay, you know, stick, blah, blah, blah. So I go up to the coach and I'm like, hey, I wanna go to Florida for spring break too. And she's like, do you have any experience playing lacrosse? I was like, no. Uh, and she's like, well, actually no one on the team wants to be a goalie. Do you wanna try out for that position? And I was like, okay. So, you know, they suit me up, I have a stick. And they throw the ball at me. And I always tell my mom, I'm like, I developed good head eye coordination growing up in your household, knowing how to block shots, right? <laughs> but, but, you know, squash definitely heightened that ability. So I was good by accident. I was able to stop the ball, and that's all they required, right? So she's like, okay you come to Florida. So I went to Florida, I trained with the girls, couldn't run that well, but I was able to stop the shot. So then I was on the team, they hired a male coach who specifically trained the goalies, right? And I don't know, I think he saw something in me and he trained me really aggressively. And again, I react well to aggression, right? And, you know, during that, I learned how to be better as an athlete and, at, you know, playing lacrosse. And one of the great components about being at Mercersburg, and, and this is where the whole private school privilege thing comes in, they hired a meditation coach. So before <laughs> every game, we would come an hour early and the meditation coach would come. And she would have us sit there and close our eyes and envision ourselves being like the best on the field. And for me as a goalie, me, like she would tell me, okay, envision yourself stopping the shot and all of that. And I really think that helped. And I carried those inklets with me into college. So I don't know if you noticed, but prior, before games, I always had some time where I'm by myself. And that's what I was doing. I was meditating and saying, I'm gonna be great. I'm gonna stop these shots because that's my job. I'm going to communicate, you know, throughout the field because I I knew I was the first line of defense, well the last line of defense, first line of offense, right? And so I just I like gave myself this like heightened capability and that's how I started playing lacrosse. And I think that's why I forget saying like I'm an athlete because I'm like the most untraditional, unconventional athlete you will ever meet. <laughs> I am like still shocked that I have 
like I hold records to this day and that, you know, you know, I feel like my name holds some weight in D3 lacrosse arena, but yeah. Yeah, I would agree a uh, hall of famer. Um, but you know, that's, that, you know, it's not a small feat to be a hall of fame goalie. And I tell everybody you're all American, whether, you know, you're voted or not, your stats held true to that. Yeah. And I do recall, so, you know, watching you before games, like it was like no talk gab time. So meaning like when you went into your zone, like you would just look at the field and you kind of sway. Like, I remember you like holding your stick and leaning on your stick and your body would rock back and forth. And you would like be mentally prepping yourself as you looked at the, your eye and your eyelashes were on point. Like you look good doing it. I'm not going to lie. Yeah. I wore makeup for every game. I remember. I remember. <laughs> Like you were like, but this like beast mode, like you'd put this beast mode on before the game, before you went out there. And, you know, I, we were mentioning before we started talking just about that level of confidence, like you were not confident. You were convinced, like, you're like, <laughs> I'm the best. I am the best. I don't care what anyone says. Oh, that ball went by. There was a, there was a hole in the stick. Like it was not my fault. I was like looking at the defense, like, where were you during that play? Um, <laughs> but no, I, I did internalize our losses, though. I will say that because you did big time. Yeah, because again, I, I put myself at such a high standard when we played that even though we were part of a team, I knew that I was that last line of defense. So if the shot went in that's on me, because again, that's what I've been like training every single day. I have one job stop the shot so when we would lose you know I would hold it harder than if we would win and if we won because I had a lot of saves I never looked at it that way I'm like we were good we had a lot of saves you know um and I think what was amazing about the the group of women that played with me um we all felt that we were the best like all of us yes. like no one was like over the other one, right? No matter what position you held, you were the best. And I think that's why we were all unconventionally really good and why we made it so far. And it helped too that we had coaches that also thought that we were the best. <laughs> and like, um, we did the Iron Woman competition. So for those of you guys tuning in, we would receive this like packet for the summer, right? And we had to do everything on this list. So, you know, run, lift weights, um, pull-ups and all this stuff. And I just remember again, you know, walking through Jamaica Queens with my goalie stick and guys on the street, they'd be like, what is that? And I'm like, oh, I'm a goalie, blah, blah. They're like, are you going fishing? So I'm like explaining <laughs> like what this giant stick is. And I would go to the handball court and I would practice like, throw it and catch it on the handball for it. it. It was the funniest thing, but that that was my training, right? So lifting weights and all that stuff, it was evident I wasn't doing it. But because during the Iron Woman competition, <laughs> um, I, I, I wasn't that great, but I still strengthened my skill set of stopping the ball and being able to throw pretty far, which I think is not easy to do, you know, when you're under pressure and a lot of women are coming out, coming at you. Um, I was a very loud, animated goalie. Um, I would come out the cage a lot. And, you know, earlier before, you know, we started this interview, I explained to you, I think I was good because I other people that played against me were intimidated, right? And, and it wasn't the eyeliner because I don't even think they could see that. It was the fact like I'm five foot two, I'm in a six foot cage. You have this much space to get the ball past me, but I'm jumping out at you, right? So as they will come and approach me, I'm yelling the plays and you know I'm loud, aggressive, hit pushed a few girls, you know, because you know the rules, about that was a little, you know, I mean, I think they made every, all the girls wear goggles, what, our third year in? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so we, we were all pretty aggressive, like bumping, hitting people, like uh, we were so scrappy and that scrappiness, I've carried it 
into my career. Like those are actually one of the attributes, like when I'm interviewing and they say, you know, why you would be good for this role is because, you know, I'm going to get the job done any means necessary and I'm going to problem solve. I'm going to find a way to, um, to, to achieve that goal under any budget. Because again, that training that we had at the collegiate level, I think helps me like in the career arena, you know? So it's like, once you're an athlete, you're always an athlete. Like it just never goes away, you know? Oh, I do. Like it's that, that need that, that athlete for life mentality of like, well, if I, if I can't run, I'll crawl, like I'll, I'll get there. Like, I don't care how I'm going to get, I will be there. I will get there. Yeah. Speaking of crawl or making a shovel snow during a snowstorm. What? Who would do that? (laughs) So we could practice. (laughs) (laughs) Oh yeah. I mean, I look back when when I saw you and I want to say, what was it? 2018 for the hall of fame stuff. Yeah. I saw you, you were like, weren't you taller? (laughs) I'll never forget that. You were like, wait, did you shrink? And I was like, no, I didn't shrink. I'm the same height. Do you remember that? Yeah. I think because you guys were in an authority position and of course you're always going to, as a student, you're viewing the, for, you know, the person in authority bigger and larger than life. Um, and it's so funny because, you know, we're not that many years apart in age, but at Dickinson, it felt like you guys had lived so much life already. Right. Cause I feel like you guys were always kind of like school us. So like, you know, once you get older, this is what you're gonna do. I think you were in law school. So you were in law school and training and, you know, coaching us at the same time, which is not easy. And like, you were super, super inspired to me because when I started Dickinson, I said, I wanted to be a lawyer, right? And I had firsthand of what that looked like because you were in law school. And more and more, I was like, I don't think I wanna do all of that, right? I don't think that's for me. Um, and it's so funny because I told someone the story a few weeks ago that I traveled abroad to Spain. I had my LSAT books and, you know, I loved the, the fashion over there and like the, they looked like they had so much life over there. And I said to my peers that were there with me, I was like, I don't think I want to go to law school. And they're like, okay, well, you need to make that, that decision. And so when I my senior year, we were doing the walk for staff that we would do. And I remember I was walking with you and uh, Coach Paul. And she was like, uh, Gabs, I'm going into this uh, fashion program at Trexel. You might want to consider that. And I was like, me into fashion? And you're like, are you serious? And like, you're so fashionable, blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, it's funny because I, kn- I didn't know that that was a career path. Like, I, I didn't know. Like, I wanted to be a lawyer because of Elle Woods and Legally Blonde, because of how cute she looked and (laughs) how she was a lawyer. Like, that's what I thought lawyers looked like. And then, you know, you would tell me about all the, you know, hard work you're doing and all that. Not that I'm not a hard worker, but it's just that didn't interest me as much, right? And then political science courses I was taking, you know, I majored in economics, minored in Spanish. I had more fun in my Spanish courses than I did in like my econ and the only econ courses I really appreciated was like when we're talking about like feminism and you know um women's rights and like the ginger wage gap like that's the only time that caught my attention right so when I did the walk and you know I started thinking about it I actually applied to Drexel um and you know I couldn't illustrate and that was just something that people really didn't know much about me. Like I could draw always from like a little girl. And so I created this portfolio. Um, and then I used the pictures from this fashion show that you guys let me do. I don't know if you remember the lacrosse team fashion show. And we had uh, President Durden in it. <laughs> that should have been an inkling there that this is what I should be doing. And so I used the pictures in there and then explained to um the professor who was interviewing me like why I should get into this program and she asked me why do you want to be in fashion and I said well I want to create clothing for women that look like me because you know I'm curvy I've always been curvy no matter how you know athletic I was I've always had this like body type and I'm like I saw how difficult it was for my mom you know battling with her weight and trying to find fashion and trying to like fit into the fashion and so I thought when I graduated design school that I was actually going to be a fashion designer making clothing like that. I didn't know 
PR and marketing was on my path, right? And that goes from me being that cheerleader on the field and playing in volleyball, playing in lacrosse and kind of like, I was naturally a, a PR marketing person, right? And I created a brand for myself, right? So as like, I rebranded myself in high school, I rebranded myself in co um, college and I didn't know it again, because no one is teaching you like go into PR marketing. They're saying being a lawyer, a doctor, an engineer, <laughs> like those are the three professions, right? Um, and so I got into Drexel, you know, graduated, had a really great GPA, and then sort of recession, and I can't find a job. Um, interview in a lot of places, and that's when I realized too that even though, you know, I was skilled, a lot of these fashion houses weren't hiring people that looked like me. And it's not just me being a black woman; it's me being a curvy black woman, right? Like you don't fit that like that look. And so I, I started working retail. And then was interning at you know different places. I interned at MTV before I graduated, um, and landed a job at a beauty company called Indique Hair, which that helped to rebuild my confidence after being in design school. And you know I worked with women that, like my boss, and I still call her my boss because like I was with her for ten years. She was so and still is so graceful so poised but super smart and built this empire of selling extensions hair extensions and no one at that time was doing that and it was so different and i remember going to my parents and i was like i'm going to you know take this job doing marketing for a hair extensions company oh my god they chewed me out they're like you have this degree and we've invested so much money like what are you doing i was like y'all just listen you know this is what i want to do um, I was with the company for 10 years. I saw, helped with the growth from two stores to 16 uh, freestanding stores in the US, two in South Africa, um, was able to do uh, collaborations with Shaka Khan, uh, create wigs for fashion shows. Uh, we did a lot of charity where we gave wigs to women battling cancer. It was like super, super fulfilling. Um, but I still had this inkling that I need to do fashion. Um, and so while there, I started my blog, Round the Way Girls for curvy fashion, um, again, because there, I don't see a lot of that like conversation out there about women embracing the skin they're in. Now it's more than ever, which is amazing, um, but I still feel like that was missing. So I launched that blog and it definitely helped me to land the position I'm at now for Shaperman, where we sell garments, um, leggings, shapewear, camis, bras. It's an online marketplace and we are a body positive um, mission driven company. And um, I'm able to help with that conversation and adding more and showing other young girls and, and even men too, because I feel like they aren't as confident as we think they are in terms of their size. I'm able to put content out there that makes women feel good in the skin that they're in. And I use myself as a muse because again, you know, our weight fluctuates, um, but we don't have to like stuff ourselves into a certain size to look good. And so I'm showing women how to do that. No, that's beautiful, Gabs. And I think that kind of goes to what, you know, <laughs> it goes to your underlying confidence of, you know, that idea that if you look good, you feel good, you act good kind of thing. And I don't mean yeah. to be, I'm not trying to be um, superficial or glib, but like mm -hmm. when you look in the mirror and you're like, I'm feeling myself. Yeah. <laughs> it's true. It's true. I recently did an interview and I actually flipped it, right? Because for a long time, it was like, if I look good, I feel good, which is why I looked so extra coming to practice, right? Now, the pandemic has helped me to understand if I feel good, I look good, right? Because, mm -hmm. you know, I definitely had those moments during the pandemic when it first started. So I bought all the food. I ate all the snacks, I'm like, oh my gosh, like the world is ending. So I'm eating all the snacks, drinking more than normal because it's like, what else is there to do? Like this has definitely, cause you know, again, I live for a schedule and I live knowing what to expect. This past like year and a half, we don't know what's next between mm -hmm. politics and writing and 
all of this, we, we don't know what, like every day there's something new. And so my body reflected that right? The stress, like I'm holding on to more weight. And for me, a super confident person, I don't care how confident you say you are, you're always going to find imperfections on yourself and nitpick those things, right? And someone who has been trained so vigorously in working out and like when you're part of a team, you work out more than often and it doesn't feel like it's working out. It's feel, it feels like I am, you know, training a part of my team. As you get older, you're not no longer a part of a team. You now need to train by yourself, right? And what does that look like? And what does that look like when you're in a pandemic and you can't go outside? So that like threw me off completely. And, you know, I gained a lot of weight. Um, I, I, I was saying to my husband, like, oh my gosh, I feel like I just, I don't feel the same. So he encouraged me to get back outside, you know, run. He's like, put your mask on and run. It's okay. You know, he's showing me like, you know, Dr. Fauci says it's okay to get sunlight. And I'm like, okay. You know, so sure, slowly, but surely I started like, you know, getting back out there and feeling good again, because when you have that adren adrenaline, um, it makes you feel like you're on top of the world. It's better than coffee, which we weren't allowed to drink in college. I didn't have my first real cup of coffee until grad school. So, <laughs> so you guys watching, again, they were training us like we were the Olympic team. We couldn't have coffee, no caffeine, okay? <laughs> we were rough. We were so rough. Yes. I don't know if, you, if that's a rule with your athletes now, no caffeine, but... I'm like, this caffeine stuff is great. Could you imagine how much better I could have been if I had coffee before a game? <laughs> What's funny, Gabs, is one of my goalies now is a coffee addict. Mm. <laughs> but I will say that my I have evolved in my coaching that still no soda. Okay. Coffee in limited amounts, so you're not dependent on it, right? Mm. But after the games, when we work hard, you can eat anything that you want. Mm. That's nice. <laughs> <laughs> That's nice. Yeah. I was in grad school. Like people thought I was like, like taking extra stuff because I'm like, no, what's an extra shot of espresso? They're like, are you serious? I was like, well, we weren't allowed to drink coffee. They're like, well, your school, they let you drink coffee. I was like, no, not the school. It was just my lacrosse. <laughs> You were so good. You didn't need it. You guys were so good. Like your team, you were all so special. And it was, you know, you're one of those kids that I know that I'm going to be connected to for the rest of my life because of yeah. just like, as much as you say we impacted and I impacted you, like you impacted me and like mm -hmm. keeping you on that straight and narrow with diet and exercise. Like yeah. I knew you were cussing me out in your head because you would look mm -hmm. me like dead in the eyes and be like, and I'm like, yep, yeah, yep. Yeah, I know Gabs. Here we go um and you know the war is over you know you're like I got this and I'm like I know you got this so I think it's also you know I don't know if I would have been able to work with a caffeinated Gabby at that point I mean you are I would have been a monster like um funny story uh, I remember so you know I'm playing on a team probably like second week and coach Ryan's like oh I want you to meet uh coach Val we brought her in specifically to train you for as a goalie I was like why and I think you were standing right there. I'm like, I, I don't need a coach. And I like walked away. <laughs> yep. I, I did not make your life easy. And then um, I think we had like 5 a.m. And so I was already annoyed that I have to be up at 5 a.m. You know, I think we were playing basketball, like doing all this stuff. And I'm just like, okay, I'm just going to do it because you guys are telling me to do it. But now you're, you're adding something else to the mix, you're adding another coach specifically for me because you're telling me my form isn't good. And I'm like telling you, my form is quite good because look at my record, like in high school, I was really great. And so, um, and I think right after you, Coach Paul came or did you guys come at the same time? I wanna say, oh, I was there with Coach Edmondson, Coach Emily first, remember? And then Coach Paul came in. I don't remember Coach Emily. So Coach Paul came in like right after me. Okay. Because she helped to prove that my form sucked, right? Because, <laughs> you know, she was she was like a really good like shooter. I don't even know what the proper term is now. Like 
again, like my lacrosse jargon isn't great, but she was so good and like could find any pocket of hole to like shoot on, right? So you are a goalie, right? So as a goalie, it's hard shooting on another goalie because you are trained as a goalie, right? So when you add someone now to the mix who is like, that's all they do, they can shoot and score at any given moment, that now makes me even better. So you helped with my form and she helped with me being able to detect any shot, right? Um, which I think was amazing. Like, and because too, you guys are so young, all three of you guys actually, and you could still play on the field, which I, you never suited up. Um, <laughs> I know now why, like if somebody was to tell me to suit up as a, I would be like, absolutely not. I don't think I could get hit with the ball again. I can't do it. <laughs> nope. <laughs> It's like, I don't think people realize the type of pain that is, you know? And then I know we you both had, hockey now. Oh yeah, yeah, we both had, you and I both, like when I played at Lehigh and you played uh, at Dickinson, like I remembered your pain because I converted in college to lacrosse and I had mm -hmm. internal bleeding in my legs too from stopping, yeah. stop the ball. Yep, mm -hmm. yep. I would have bruises this big that would last the whole summer. And um yeah, and it's a mental thing too, because when you're playing and you get dinged in the head, even though we had a helmet, it's like, bing, right? Like, and you're seeing something come at you so fast. Um, because even though we're D3, there's still like, you know, I feel like people choose the D3 round, not necessarily because of skill set, but because of the type of education that they want to receive. So these girls are like shooting like super fast at me and some of them I think was aiming for my head <laughs> and, and if your stick isn't getting there fast enough you're getting clunked right um which is not necessarily a bad thing because that means the ball was mine because you hit me in the head so sometimes I, I endured that pain for that reason but um it also was like a constant reality check that you're not invincible you know you're not mm -hmm. invincible and uh sometimes mistakes will happen and you know you got to rely on your team to communicate properly so it's like i encourage all young people to join a team no matter if you're good or not it doesn't matter is because at the end of the day you can't be an app like you can't you won't play professionally for the rest of your life right but the skills and the, the life lessons that you gain from it it lasts with you forever Honestly, I think you're hitting the nail on the head, Gabs, because, you know, it sounds really weird, but like we have these ideas and these concepts, right, in society of like, and I think they change as, you know, it's times change, but there's still this idea that maybe females don't need to be on a team. Maybe they should be focused in other areas. Like, it's so crucial, like, you know, that, that females, you know, have a place and males too, of course, but then you have a place to develop. And have that team experience. There's nothing like letting down your team. Yeah, that's the worst feeling ever. I remember our um, very, very, very last game we played and I sucked big time. <laughs> that feeling like lived with me for like a good two years after because I think it's like if we won, we would have made it to the next levels, the NCAAs. And it, it, we were all shocked that we even made it that far. And it's just that day for, I don't know what it was, but my A game wasn't there. I wasn't the best. And I could just see the look of like, you know, defeat in everyone. And again, because I internalized that and now I know I'm, 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 I'm an empath and it now it makes more sense, but then I didn't know what that was called. It just made me feel like crap. And I was like, damn, like, this is my time to be like the best. And this team wasn't better than us. And it was crazy. And I remember you guys too, you looked really sad. And it was one of those things where you guys just didn't have, you didn't know how to console us all. Even the parents, like when everyone's collectively sad, <laughs> like and someone's dad came up to me. I don't, I don't know if it was, uh, I forget who's, who's dad. But they were just like, you just like, Gabs, you know, you gave me your all, you know, you were really good these last four years. Like, and that was helpful, but I was just like, I know I sucked, <laughs> but you can't tell me that. Um, but that was a life lesson that we're not gonna win at all. 
who are never going to win it all. And you got to learn how to have defeat. Um, thankfully enough, I've never been fired before, but I can imagine that's what being fired feels like, right? When you've just like, you've, you thought you gave it your all, but it wasn't good enough. And it, this is the end of the road because that was our last game ever as a team. And, and that was tough. That was a hard pill to swallow. Yeah, that was the Elite Eight. We were up in, we were up north. Um, we were playing the Elite Eight. If we won that game, we would have went to the Final Four. But I will say that I think that I think that as coaches, we probably didn't say the right things because we were just we were so shocked that we didn't win. Like we we believed that we were a, that you all. And honestly, I won't lie. I'll speak for Coach Paul and myself. Like we were part of you. Right. So we deserve to win. We are the best. We are here. Like, so I think that it was just like, and then not being able to give you that as your coaches, not being able to be like, no, here's the win or here's the reason. It's just the other team was better. And that was so hard to articulate that, like you did everything you could and somebody was just better. It doesn't take away from how awesome you are. It was their day. That, yeah. that was a great lesson, but it's also like, it made me like, oh, I just, I, I know I cried for you, for you, not for mm -hmm. myself, like, but for all of you, it was just like, it was so painful because I was like, there was nothing else to be done. Like we did it all and it still didn't go our way. And that, yeah. I think that's hard. Mm -hmm. It's tough. Were we your first like coaching um, team? You guys... Uh, were my first like real foray like into coaching like I don't know if you guys know but I chose my law school based on which programs got back to me the quickest of where I could coach wow that's crazy I didn't know that yeah it meant a lot to be there like even when I was your final year mm -hmm. I was working in the field as a lawyer and I would leave work to come train you guys I remember and it, it was really crazy because I would ask myself, why are you a Dickens? Like, I, and I didn't know that story, but I'm like, why is she a Dickinson? You know, like, cause you're telling me all this experience and not that Dickinson wasn't great, but it's a small town. It doesn't attract young people at all. Um, and then I'm like Dickinson law, not to say Dickinson law is in a good school, but I'm like, you're wicked smart too. You know, again, Dickinson law is a good school, but nobody really like wants to live in Carlisle for three years. <laughs> So, so now that you're telling me it's because of the program, like that makes so much sense. Like it does. And I think you guys, I'm going to show you something. I want your gut. Re I knew you were a good drawer. I knew um, this has been in my office. <laughs> you're going to get me. <laughs> Anywhere I've been, this has been in my office. Mm -hmm. Wow. Oh my gosh. Oh my gosh. You remember this? Can you please send me a picture of that? Yes. <laughs> wow. I was talented. <laughs> oh, see, there she is. There's my girl. There's my girl. But like, as much as like, and I don't mean to get emotional, but like yeah. these spaces that we create with other, I think it's for me, it's especially with other women and like you embrace their journey and you're not trying to be competitive. You're just trying to like get together. Like these are things like, I bet you didn't know, even as a lawyer, this sat behind my desk every day. This has been with me since 2006. Wow. And I don't even hang my law degree. <laughs> Cause you're the most unconventional lawyer ever. I mean, like, Let's get into that. <laughs> I was oh, like, no. do you like being a lawyer? Because I remember when you quit law and was coaching. And I was like, okay. And, and <laughs> you know, earlier uh, before this interview, we were discussing how, like, we really don't, like, live our lives for money, right? We live it for fulfillment and all of that. And I know anything you do, you would be incredible at. And if you wanted to be a lawyer, you'd be incredible. And you know, there's no secret lawyers get paid very well. Um, and <laughs> and you're like, nope, quitting this and I'm gonna be 
a coach. And I'm like, that's amazing because at two, I know it's not so much just about coaching and like winning games, but you're directly impacting young people's lives. Um, and, and you said earlier, like some people think that women don't need to be a part of a team and they need to do other things. I'm like, I learned how to be a strong woman, like for real play, being a part of a team where it's your peers that are also holding you accountable. It's your peers that like check you left and right when you're not doing something that you're supposed to. I remember we would have sit downs all the time and we would air out any issues that we had with one another. As a young person, you know, 19 years old, when there's tons of egos, I remember um, Katie Austin, I'll never forget this. She was like, you know, I, I was really like upset with you because I found out that you missed curfew. And, and then you came and you played in the game, but you didn't, you didn't go to curfew. And I'm just like, A, I'm like, like, who told you that? And like, B, I'm like, damn, you're holding me accountable. Like, you know, and so that, that outing, you know, for, for me knowing that it's not just, you know, I'm not just a part of this team to like win games. I'm part of this team because I made a commitment, not just to me, but to all the women around me, right? And we all have to walk the walk and, you know, and and do things with intent and be a good person. Cause that's what it was about. Like being a good person because me missing curfew and like knowing nobody would know because we're not hanging out in the same circles, uh, that's still being deceitful. Right, because I'm like nobody would know. So, so what? <laughs> um, and I and it's funny because I don't think I've brought that up to her, you know, present day. But she also was somebody that I looked up to a lot. You know, she's tall and she's like confident, but never had to say that she's good. You know, um, and funny. Like everyone really admired her and. You know, so when someone like that, like tells you that you need to do better, they're like, you hold that to a higher standard. Um, and I don't think, you know, a coach can do that, right? It's, it has to be somebody that's also like in the grind with you, you know? Um, so I think you guys did a really good job of making us strong women. And if, you know, if I have kids, I will, I'm going to make them do sports from a very young age, no matter if they're a boy or a girl, because I think that sets a tone for how you treat people. I think it does too. And I think it's important what you're saying, you're hitting the nail on the head, Gabs, with like, um, you ever feel like, well, what I do doesn't matter. Not that you don't matter in the big picture and not that you're not important and not that you're not confident and have self-worth of, but like, like, oh, I can go out late. Like, does it really matter? And you're like, oh, it did. Like that, yeah. pull, that, like, like when you start realizing that people like, and it, it translates right into work and into your family and all these interrelationships, they connect and you're like, oh God, I didn't realize that my actions, cause they didn't hurt anyone, but because, but they did like, that's a mind blowing experience. Mm -hmm. And also too, it teaches you how to be, um someone that can take criticism well and then someone that like even when you're in a, a relationship with your partner is like you're now a part of a team and you now have a commitment to making sure that your team thrives and that you win and and when I say win you know it's more so like you're hitting your goals that you set as a family and I think and I don't know if there's any statistics about that, but I would love to know if there's any correlation between, um, you know, good relationships and athletes. Like, I don't know. I would love to know, you know? Um, and it doesn't matter if your partner was also an athlete too. Like, you know, my husband, he didn't play sports, but he, cause we had this conversation recently. He's like, I wasn't a part of a team, but I had like eight siblings and we were a team of, of our own and we had to learn how to communicate. And if, you know, they would be the first ones to like beat you up if you didn't do something well, you know? So it's like, that's still a team dynamic, right? And so I wonder too, if like single, like kids that don't have siblings and who have never been a part of a team, if they have like a different trajectory because they don't know now how to communicate with large groups of people, you know? No, it makes sense. It's that group mentality and group responsibility. I mean, I think it, it can, even in a world of COVID, I think that if you're yeah. even in an online workout community or like what you're saying, like when you're speaking with your company that's in South America, right? Mm -hmm. There's this level of connection and you have a team. That's your yeah. team. I mean, mm -hmm. you're not physically there, but you have accountability. You're setting boundaries. You're setting deadlines. You're brainstorming. Like you have 
this group, this team that works together. And I think that that, I think that people that don't experience this in some way, they probably struggle with learning it later. I would think, I don't know. Mm -hmm. I think you're absolutely right. It's that accountability um, and then making deadlines. And cause like even now, you know, cause you know, I'm on Zoom calls all day and you know, it, it might, some days might be difficult but I'm like, if I don't hand this in now it's going to affect the person that I know that needs to work on this. So, and it, it's like, whose priority is more important, right? And because we all have priorities. And so um, I think, you know, being an athlete helps me to navigate like when my priority is is like the main one or, or how can I um, not necessarily sway someone to get what I need done, but to be able to understand that they are also um, in this grind with you and how can I help them to get their thing done and how can they help me to get my thing done and communicate effectively? Because I think at the end of the day now, even like working during COVID, your communication needs to be the best it can be right now because, you know, emailing or if you're slacking, you're texting, that can all be taken out of context. Right. So mm -hmm. you got to make sure you're articulating very, very, very well. And then Zoom call. Now people are reading your facial expressions. So sometimes, you know, I could have uh, resting bitch face. I don't know if I can say that word on this. On this okay. Thing. Okay. But, you know, sometimes you're on a call and you're just like, like, you know, it's not like I don't want to be here, but it's like, this is just my normal face, you know? And so then I have to like perk up because I'm like, I don't want the person who's looking at me to think that I don't want to be here or that I'm sad or, you know, or I have to use the bathroom because we've been talking for 40 minutes and I, you know, like, I can't just go. So it's like all those things come into play, right? Like, how do you present yourself to your colleagues, to your peers, to your, your partner, um, with knowing that we're all going through a rough time, you know? Yeah, it is tough. I think that, you know, I catch myself even like asking, like, are you okay? And they're like, this is my face. I'm like, sorry. But... <laughs> Yeah, no one taught you how to look normal on Zooms. This is new. It is new. And what else is funny is like, you know, like when somebody like looks down for a little bit and then they laugh and then you see somebody else on the screen laugh, I'm like, put down your phone. <laughs> yeah, I'm guilty of that too. Cause then I'm looking at the thing and I'm like, can they see that I'm on my phone? Because you know, a text may come through or, you know, I don't know if you're like me, but I'm, I guess I'm one of those millennials that like have to check Instagram every 20 minutes. And so <laughs> I'm like, even though I know nothing's happening, it's just a natural thing to like check Instagram. Um, but I'm paying attention, but you can see my eyes are like elsewhere looking at, like I have a double screen looking at something else. So it's, it's been really hard to like navigate this new norm. And also to know deep down that this is going to be life for the next, probably next two years. Yeah, I would, that is, this. I think that's the scary truth, right? And yeah. then how do we, like, that's, and you know, these are what these conversations are about. Like, this is real stuff. Like, we're, how do we, I like to say boss up instead of man up or woman up. Like, how do we boss up and like get it done in a way that's healthy for our mind, spirit, and body, like that holistic, because you could spend, like you're, do we talked about this previously, like, and I was like, do I have to send you an email about time management so that, Gabrielle Joffe Richards to, doesn't pour from an empty cup and you're like <laughs> yeah I mean yes time management's important but this is this will be life for the next two years because and I, I'm saying that to say that when 2020 December of 2020 everyone thought 2021 COVID was going to end you know politics were going to get better you know, like people were stopping racist. Like 2021 was supposed to be the answer for everything. And then January 2021 hits and like all this stuff still is still happening, right? Yes, there's a vaccine out, but let's be real. Like once you get that, you still need to have your mask on. You, you still need to practice social distancing. And some people are still racist. Like that's, again, that's not gonna end right now, you know? And again, I'm hopeful, but these are like the, the truths that we have to live with and like, how do we navigate around this? And, you know, and Zoom is now your new office. So that's a new truth. 
<laughs> and so how you speak to people and, and how you look on your, like all that stuff matters now, you know? No, I fully agree. And it's like, I don't know what kind of past advice or future advice that we need to give ourselves, but like, I like the big thing that you're saying again, I feel like you, there is a reason that we met in life because I'm like, oh, look, it's tw January 1, 2021. Everything's the same, right? <laughs> like, Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, so, I mean, what do you, what would you say to yourself in the past or the future? Like knowing what today is knowing, okay, I'm going to say it. You have an empire. Like, I don't care what you say. You have an empire. I love it. I love fangirling and I'm so proud of you. And I know that you're proud of yourself. Like that's something I'm trying to flip the script on too, with like talking with young people and you're considered that as well. Uh, instead of me saying, you know, Gabs, I'm so proud of you. I, I want to say like, oh my gosh, how proud of you are you? Mm. so that intrinsic value like you're not dependent on a coach Val for a high five even though it feels amazing I know um but you're like no no and I think you're some one of the few that could say no I'm proud of me like I work really hard to be where I'm at and I I'm still in my trajectory I'm still going so I mean like I don't even know like what do we say to past Gabrielle future Gabrielle like what kind of advice do you want to give her that's funny and thank you for that but um, what I say I'm proud of myself right now, no, because I'm like, I still have so much to do, right? There's so much um, of me to give to the world that I felt like, you know, for about five, six years, I wasn't giving to the world. I was in a point of, uh, and I don't want to call it depression, but I was like, yeah, when I left design school, it was like, I had raised the bar so high. Like I told my mom, like I would be designing Louis Vuitton bags. Like that's how I convinced them that I should be going to law. I mean, to design school. So when, when that wasn't happening for me, it's like, I kind of put myself in my own little cave because I was like, I am not where I said I was going to be. And I'm not fulfilling what I need to be fulfilling. And, you know, I feel like just recently, maybe the last uh, two years, I've been living in my truth. And now the world is starting to see that. Um, what I would tell my past self is to not take life so seriously, you know, to be present and to just live. And it's okay to make mistakes because I will make mistakes. Um, also, uh, try to understand people more. Um, don't internalize losses. Don't internalize, you know, people being mean to you, right? Because hurt people hurt people, right? And for a period of time, I felt hurt. And therefore, I wasn't the best at times, right? In terms of relationships with people. And um, even I remember in, in uh, college, you know, some of my uh, peers they were like oh do you want to be in the plus size fashion show and I'm like I'm not plus size and, and that was like a thing and they're like but you are and I'm like but I'm not you know so it's like I because I didn't like the word plus size and I still don't like plus size as a as a phrase so I, you would never hear myself calling myself that I call myself curvy uh, I don't know it just sounds better for me um because saying plus size is like you're you're different you're a different size you know so I'm trying to change like how we label those types of things but um I I felt like I was always struggling with that like my sense of self who am I who am I in this world who am I in these like private upper echelon schools you know like who am I as, as that person and so I would tell myself to relax and be me right and you know don't care what the labels are that people are going to give you because everyone's going to give you a label because when you're so out of pocket when you're so like extra it's like people want to put that label on you to help them understand you right and because again like i will wear like the craziest colors together and like these like ridiculous coach boots with fur i don't know if you remember those but it's like 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 the most outrageous like pieces of fashion like i had it and that's what made me happy but people didn't understand me and therefore they're labeling and so i would tell myself not to take that seriously and help people understand me better by being more authentic and who I am. And I feel like now I'm just now understanding that and I'm just now saying, okay, 
this is who I am and, and, and this is what makes me happy. This is what makes me comfortable. I have a lot more to do. You know, I want to become um, a body positive expert. I want to actually take courses in that because, you know, I've labeled myself as a body positive advocate, but there's just so much more studying to be done for me to help change the trajectory of, of you know, what people think like a body positive person is. Um, it, it's so complex. Um, and, I, you know, I know we're going over, but I wanted to tell you the story about Lizzo. She most recently was trying to work out. And, you know, the plus size community went in on her, which is crazy because I will say the plus size community is actually one of the nicest communities to be a part of. Um, everybody, at least that I know, super friendly. So I think she did like this detox and, you know, people were like, oh, you're supposed to be body positive. Why do you want to lose weight? And she's like, oh, chill out. Like, I just wanted to like get my body back into order, you know? And, you know, she said, um, I think she was on David Lenham or something where she was like, she can outrun anybody out there. Don't look at her size and think that she's not capable. And for me, I, I, I took that in because when Lizzo first came out, I didn't really like her that much. I'm like, how dare she be so confident? What? How dare she show her cellulite? Like, we don't do that. We cover up. Like, I have all these capes because I don't want people to see my cellulite and all this stuff. And, and then I was like, wait, she's doing what is supposed to be done. She's changing that narrative. She can twerk in a thong on because Beyonce's twerking in the thong and nobody's saying anything, but because, you know, she doesn't look like your standard of beauty, that's a problem, right? So she's encouraged me to accept myself more for who I am and to then do more research about this topic because it's relatively new. Um, some people think to be body positive is to just show a, a curvy girl and that's not it. It's just, it's so much more to that. So I like, if, if we have this conversation 10 years from now, like I'm challenging myself to actually be an authority in that and have a book about it. So yeah, oh. and then I can say, I'm proud of me that then I'll be able to say, yes, I'm proud. Like I'm doing what I'm supposed to be doing. Oh, God. You're, you're on it though. Like you're on it. Like, and I know you and you're going to strive for excellence. You're going to pack your schedule. You're going to push yourself until there's nothing left to give. And then you're going to take like 10 minutes to be like, I need a breath. You're like, I'm meditating. It's fine. You know, and I, I love it. And I want a book dedicated to me, of course, not the dedica not dedication, like scribble. Yeah. Yeah. I'm going to reach out to you also too, for like the legal stuff. <laughs> Absolutely. No, I love it. I mean, I don't want to get sued. You know, I, <laughs> that's it right don't get sued um it's interesting though Gabs because you know I hear what you're saying and watching your evolution and how you're coming into your truth and you know we're going to wrap up here in a minute but like I do want to know what your core values are like I can hear them I hear them but I want to see what you think knowing coach Val knowing Gabs <laughs> Gabrielle Richards I want to hear what you think your core values are and what you know them to be because I want to see if I'm right. I'm probably wrong, but I want to see if I'm right. Right. So um, this is great because um, a few years ago at my last job, and you know, I call them my family, we did a big project about core values. And it, it's so funny because the core values ended up being what our own internal core values are. And so I can easily tell you that one of my core values is to do what it takes, right? Second one is, is to do the right thing when no one's looking, which I think is huge, right? Because it's like, you know, when you're in front of people, you're going to be like on your, your best behavior. But are you on your best behavior when you're behind closed doors and it's just you and your thoughts, right? So uh, that's a strong one for me. And, and the third one is to like lead with integrity and be honest, you know? Um, and sometimes that can get you in trouble, you know? I feel like <laughs> that I've been honest from day one, you know, whether it's an expression or what I'm saying out loud, but um, I hold that deep to my heart because if you are honest 24 seven, no one can ever, you know, catch you in a lie or whatever, because, you know, you're honest. So those are the three. Well, what's funny is that I had for you integrity, honesty, and hard work. Wow. 
Wow. Yes. That's like spot on. <laughs> I still know you. <laughs> that is spot on. Wow. I think that you've known who you were for a really long time and you're finally able to show the world and it's just absolutely beautiful. And you, by the way, you don't age. I, I gotta figure this out. You don't age either. What are you talking about? It's like, that's why I'm having a hard time understanding that I was like on the field with you. I have to say like 15 years ago. Like, that's crazy. Air high fives for us. <laughs> like, um, but I will say, you know, working out definitely attributes to it. Drinking water attributes to it um, and living with integrity because, you know, when you're not doing what you're supposed to be doing, it starts to show on the outside. So I think that has a lot to do with it. And I know a lot of the melanin that we both have definitely helps. It does. I mean, I will back that. Our melanin definitely helps. <laughs> I'm dead right now. I'm just dead. <laughs> I'm just saying, just putting that out there. So I love it. I love how honest you are. All right, Gabs, last thing. You get to turn the tables. What's one thing you always wanted to ask me that I was like, nope? Or like, what's one thing you want to know? You get to ask. It's your turn. Mm -hmm. Um so you stayed with us after you graduated law school. Ugh. And I wanted to know why, why, why didn't you leave us and start your life? Because I think you had had like a, you know, new husband, you know, like your life was ready to be lived. And I feel like we kind of held you back that year because you stayed. So why? You always ask the good questions. You were always a pain in my butt. No, I'm just kidding. Um, <laughs> you always held me accountable. Um, I think it's a great question. Um, I think that I knew that I was becoming a lawyer and being a lawyer because it was what was expected out of me by outside family influences. And it was something that I said I'd always do. So I felt like I'd be a fraud if I didn't. Mm -hmm. However, um, I never felt more at home and more able to be weak and strong and a goofball or serious, you know, I was able to be everything that I wanted to be with you guys. And your team was special. And I wanted to see you through to a championship. Like there was something about you girls. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I loved working with you specifically. Like it was like the joy of my day to try to splash mud on you and get you to throw something at me. It was like my like bet for the day of how quick I can make Gabs mad. It was fun. Um, but it was also just like, you all ignited my passion of what I really wanted to be, but I wasn't brave enough to take it on. And then when I was leaving law, like legal work mm -hmm. and, you know, rushing to the field, because remember, I just stayed with your team. I didn't stay with both teams. Like I didn't stay with the other sport I was coaching as well, just your team. And it was, there was just something really special that I knew that I would regret if I missed it. And I like to see your faces. Like it was so exciting to get to practice. It was so exciting to be a part of this journey. And I was probably, you know, internalizing and taking like all of your, I'm an empath like you. So all of your joy, your happiness, you guys were just so happy to be alive in a space together. Yeah. And I couldn't let it go. And I, I didn't feel like it was, I felt like practicing law was holding me back from accepting who I was. Wow. That's deep. Oh, it took a long time to get there because I stuff like this. <laughs> love it. Oh my gosh. I, I, I can't tell you, like this is in my office. Like this isn't a Gabrielle original 06, 06. Yeah. It's even labeled. I think that's the only piece of woodwork that I've made. Like I probably did that specifically for you for this project. <laughs> Wow. Well, what's crazy is these are three different photos of me coaching you. Wow. Wow. That's really cool. Like I've shocked myself. Like <laughs> I don't think that we know the impact that we have on each other as human beings. 
until much later when you reflect back and how you carry pieces of people and to be a part of like a group of women like your team was, you were all so very different from all different socioeconomic backgrounds, um, different walks of life. And just to be able to come together and be in the same space and just laugh at things and be ridiculous. I think that was something that, you know, I knew it wasn't going to come around again. Like I knew that. And like for all of you, you know, the things that we try to tell you is like live this moment and love it because you're going to reflect back on some of the most fun and bonds that you have. Like, I mean, we mentioned, you mentioned before when we were speaking, just people were reaching out to you recently, just checking on you from your team, yeah. just giving you love. Like that just sticks. Yeah. And you know what? I think this is important to say that never once did, okay, for the, those of you guys tuning in, you know, I was the only African-American woman on the lacrosse team. And I, I say woman because I don't think we had any black guys playing men lacrosse either um so it it was very unusual but the ladies on the team my coaches never once made me feel out of place never once was like race an issue and so when you know black lives matter and all all of that was happening and coming to the forefront you know one by one different ladies on the team reached out via email or uh direct message on Instagram, like, you know, just letting you know, I'm thinking of you. And, and that was, it was super important because again, they never made me feel that I was less than, that I wasn't capable of, like like, race wasn't a thing. If anything, you know, they will poke fun about the outlandish fashions that I was wearing, you know, but it was never like, this is a black girl on our lacrosse team. I never, felt that way um, in high school and in college. And I think and that's super important to know because traditionally lacrosse is a very uh, non-Black sport. <laughs> you know, um, more and more I'm starting to see, you know, women of color playing, which I think is great because I think it's starting to receive more recognition. Um, every single lacrosse player I've met, whether it was like on a Dickinson team or Drexel team, they were all, all badasses. Like they all strong, confident women. And um, I will say, you know, we did have a special group, you know, from the coaches to the, the ladies on the team. And we were all women empowerment focus, you know, we're feminists, we were like, we would fight if we didn't get the right field because the guys had it because they had a game like it just didn't make sense because we knew we were a better team. Let's be honest, like, you know, we were breaking records, we were winning games. Um, you know, we had the data to prove it. And so I, I want to say thank you. Right. Thank you to you. Thank you to coach. Paul to coach Ryan for helping to raise us into the woman we are because you know you go to college you think you're an adult you're not really an adult yet like you're, you're still learning who you are what you need to do you're still learning your likes your dislikes um, you're still learning how to communicate properly and um, you know social media isn't what it is now I, I said to you earlier if we had it back then like we would probably be on a reality show because of the personalities and um you guys had to deal with a lot because we weren't easy. We weren't an easy group of girls to deal with. You know, we were cocky. We would constantly, you know, hold you guys accountable. We had demands, you know, we just, you know, we were, we were special and we wanted you guys to treat us like we were special, right? Not acknowledging that you guys had your own things to work through, you know, your own families, your own careers, like, because you guys put us first. And I, like I said, I want to thank you for that because it's helped me to be who I am today. And um, it's helped me to say confidently that I was a student athlete and that I was good. And, and, and then I have pictures to prove it because people don't believe me. <laughs> you have them call me. Gabs, you weren't good. You were great. You are great. You hold national, you hold NCAA records to this day. You have you know, if I think that there's one thing that somebody could take from, you know, listening today, it's, you know, you've got to own your awesome. And you certainly owned your awesome on a daily basis. Right. And that quote down. You can. That's actually a uh, Valerie original, owning your awesome. I like that. You did, though. Think about it. Like, 
whatever you had to give that day, you're like, I'm the best at this today. And that's all that matters. You owned who you were. Mm -hmm. And I think that that helped a lot of people around you own who they are. Because there's nothing wrong with knowing that you're awesome and sharing that awesome. Because you never use it to make anybody feel bad. Mm -hmm. That's not the point. You never use it to say, I'm better than you. It's, hey, I'm awesome. Let's be awesome together. Yeah. I think that's a good point because when now when I meet women specifically who don't know they're awesome, I'm like, wait a minute, let's take a pause. You've done this, 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 and that. Like you're incredible. Why don't you know this? And I and I think that's why I've been in marketing and branding for so long because I'm constantly having to explain to people why they're great. And I just I don't get it. Um, but it is more difficult to look yourself in the mirror and say, you're great too. You know, like that's always going to be tough, but um, again, I'm, I'm starting to embrace it and, and thank you for this. Thank you for having me on this interview. Um, it's exciting to know that I do have a story to tell because I think sometimes you forget, <laughs> you know, and, and I just hope that, you know, like I said, 10 years from now, I have a bigger story and, you know, the good work that you're doing, you know, within the mental space, within um, athletics, you have, you know, your larger platform to share with people because I think you are a gift to society. And so um, I want to, anything you need for me to help continue to embrace this and to, you know, push your platform further let me know you are absolutely the best still and i appreciate your time it means the world gabs i know you're so busy and i'm i, I don't care that you're how proud of you i'm to the moon like oh thank you're my girl gabs so thank you. thank you and thank your family for letting me steal all this precious time because i know it's I know. precious i was supposed to be making him eight so i was like i got an interview <laughs> Yeah, tell him I'll, I'll send him something. I'm sorry. <laughs> but thank you, Gabrielle. Gabrielle Joffy Richards, but you're always Gabs in my heart. Um, go enjoy your Sunday and thank you so much. Thank you. Bye. Bye.